Hi gang, deep in the jungles of Beta Amphilian 4, a conspiracy is underway. An Imperial task force investigates an isolated research station, unaware that they're being hunted by Tyranids with the scariest evolutionary adaptation known to man. Yep, wings. Yeah, doesn't seem as scary anymore, but let's look at the Amphelium project. Imperial Armor 4, the Amphelion Project, was a campaign supplement for Warhammer 40k released in December 2006 by Forgeworld. Like the previous Imperial Armor book, the Tauros campaign, video just up there, this was a narrative campaign supplement detailing a single event in the Imperium's long and bloody history, but unlike Tauros and the books that came after it, the Amphelion Project was less about a war and more about a single mission. Written by Warwick Kimray, the Amphelion Project told the story of an elite strike force investigating a loss of contact with an isolated Imperial research station over a period of about four days. The story is told in minute detail, almost an hour by hour account, related through conventional narration, but also pieced together from recovered maps, after action reports, and secret intercepted transmissions, which gives it a really atmospheric feel. It's a really tense story with elements of loads of classic storytelling tropes, hovering somewhere between Predator, Jurassic Park, and Alien, with its mix of horrifying jungle warfare against alien monsters and tense sweeps of abandoned installations. Of course, like all these Imperial Armor books, it was really an excuse to showcase the latest range of Forge World giant Tyranid models. What are now classics got their first look in here, from the Trigon to the barbed and scythed Hera Jewel and the massive Harridan. This was even the first outing, in model form, for winged hive tyrants and flying Tyranid warriors, here named Shrikes. Many of the models in this supplement would later just become normal things for Codex Tyranids armies to include, but back in 2006 the idea of flying Tyranid armies was pretty new, and therefore it plays quite an important part in the plot of this book. On the Imperial side, this was an excuse to feature some of Forge World's existing ranges. The Elysian drop troops from the Taros campaign were back in the form of the Elite Detachment D99, the Red Scorpions made another appearance, and there were a few small additions like the Cadian hostile environment upgrade set, or Inquisitor Solomon Locke and his retinue. But really, this was all about the Tyranid models, and of course, the Anthelion base itself, which was available at a colossal cost as a Forge World Redin scenery kit. Good luck ever getting the mold release off that. Ah, if only it was 2006 again. The book was refreshed for a second edition in 2014, which updated the graphic design and tidied up some loose ends in the plot, so it's that version I'll mostly be working from in this video. If you want to read it yourself in way more detail, it's available on the Warhammer Plus Vault. The Anphelion Project was cloaked in secrecy from the beginning. At the start of 850 M41, the following message was dispatched from the Lord Inquisitor Varius of the Ordo Hereticus to Inquisitor Solomon Locke. As of 8071-850-M41, routine astropathic communications with the research facility on Beta Amphilium 4 were broken off mid-transmission. Repeated efforts to re-establish contact with the facility's command complex have failed. It is a matter of some urgency that contact is restored, and to this end, an investigation team is to be assembled under your command and dispatched to the Amphelion system in order that this message be investigated and reported. Lord Inquisitor Varius had been active in the area for some time, at the forefront of research against the continuing threat of the Tyranids. It had been in almost a hundred years since the first tyrannic war, the incursion into imperial space of high fleet Behemoth. But smaller incursions had continued, and splinter fleets from the original invasion were still active, hiding out in the void between stars and descending on nearby worlds. As such, he was in a position to requisition serious backup for this investigation. Locke was travelling in the company of the Cadian 266th Regiment, and had been assigned an Exploritas team 
training from the Adeptus Mechanicus, led by Majos biologist Arthon, as well as an elite veteran unit of the Elysian drop troops, Detachment D-99. D-99 were a specialist inquisitorial unit, originally composed of the surviving members of the 99th Elysian drop regiment. After seeing service against the Tyranids at Molech, Haman's World, and Moran, the regiment had caught the eye of Lord Varius and were inducted into an experimental Inquisition-run program to create soldiers more suited to the war against the Xenos. In a series of experimental surgeries already field tested on the Lost Top 23rd, the survivors of the 99th have been gene altered. The Elysians underwent an extensive series of excruciating modifications to make them more resistant to pain and to Xenos pathogens, as well as implanting new glands to stimulate periods of hyperaggression as a threat response. All intended to make them superior soldiers when pitted against the Tyranids. The mission to Amphelion would be Detachment D-99's first action post-modification. But it's testament to the resources available to the Inquisitor Lord that D-99 weren't the most elite unit attached to the mission. Once in system, Locke would be joined by a strike cruiser from the Red Scorpion's Astartes chapter, under the command of the then Commander Carab Cullen. How much of all the backstory to this was known to Locke is unclear. His orders were certainly more general in tone. The base at Beta Amphilium 4 was suspected of conducting unsanctioned, potentially heretical research, and the environment was to be considered extremely hostile. Land, investigate the lack of communication, retrieve any evidence of heretical research, and return it into inquisitorial hands. The ship assigned for the mission, the Sephestus, arrived at Amphelion in 194-850-M41 and started its long journey in system, linking up with the Red Scorpions on the way. The site of the research station was Beta Amphelion 4, the fourth moon of the gas giant Beta Amphelion, which was the second planet around Amphelion. The moon was small and cold and covered with lakes of liquid ammonia, which had led to a jungle like ecosystem of ammonia-based flora and a high concentration of ammonia in the otherwise breathable atmosphere. Troops would be being deployed with breathing equipment in case the levels got too high. Incomplete records of the base indicated a central control complex with satellite laboratories stationed across the moon and containment areas delineated by force field fences to house their experiments. Locke submitted the first progress report as they were inbound at 194850. Attempted contact with the base control centre hadn't received a response. Maybe the base was deserted or the occupants turned renegade. The plan was for the Red Scorpions to make their initial deployment into the control centre and their Terminator squads had begun preparations for the mission. Once a landing zone had been made safe, they'd be followed by the Inquisitor and his aides, then Detachment D-99 and finally the Majos and the Cadians. After the task force had landed, the Cephestus would return to high orbit to await extraction orders, which Locke confidently predicted would be two days after deployment. All was on schedule. Which reminds me, we're going through this whole report by the Imperial date. If you're not familiar with Imperial dating, then this part is the year, and this part is the year fraction, which is what's mostly used here. A standard year split down into 1,000 segments. For our purposes, each time this number goes up one, that's about eight hours of real time. If you want to know more, again, there's a whole video on it here. At 198 850, 32 hours later, the deployment began with the Red Scorpion's Terminators landing on what initially seemed to be a deserted control center. No signs of life were found on the ore specs, and all containment fences were down. The three Terminator squads, led by Cullen, spread out, cutting their way into the sealed buildings with chain fists and charges, but the base was empty. Central power was off, though Terminator Scrod Realm found signs of combat in one of the outbuildings. Locke's team and the Mechanicus forces deployed directly to the command center a few hours later, his progress report noting that the jungle seemed unhealthy and grey, in some areas decaying. The team split up, searching for maps of the base and interrogating the command center's data core. It took a little while, but by 200 850, the task force had a better picture picture of the events compiled by the Majos. Since the first incursion in 745, the Ordo Xenos had considered the Tyranids a growing threat and had established a number of research bases to study captured bioforms in a controlled environment 
in an attempt to manufacture anti-Tyranid weapons. Early successes of this program had included the mutagenic acid rounds used by the Death Watch. The base on Beta Amphelium 4 was just one of these research stations. The entire site, covering a large part of the moon, was divided into three main containment zones, Alpha, Beta and Omega, and three laboratories. Delta, Gamma, and Theta, along with spaced out generator emplacements. And at the middle of all this was the command center. No records existed of why the containment fences were down or the generators off, but further inspection revealed that while the fences were off, they didn't appear to be damaged they'd been powered down rather than destroyed. With the news of an imminent threat from escaped Tyranids, Locke started to issue his orders, but outside the base, the Xenos had already caught up with them. The Red Scorpion's Terminators guarding the perimeter started to receive ore specs pings inbound from within the jungle, and with little warning, waves of gene stealers leapt from the decaying plant matter. All three squads opened fire as they reported contact, assault cannons and storm bolters blazing as they slowly fell back to guard the entrances to the base. Gene stealers were cut down in their tens, but not all the Terminators could disengage in time. Squad Realm were trailing as the Bioforms forced their way inside the defences, killing Sergeant Realm and another of his battle brothers before, suddenly, the assault ceased and the jungle was quiet once more. With the severity of the threat clear, the entire task force started deployment. The priority was the containment fences. Detachment D-99, hastily erecting makeshift landing fields near the command center, would fly missions out to each generator complex to bring them back online, as the rest of the Red Scorpion's task force deployed to the command center to hold the line. Once the power had been restored, the Red Scorpion's Terminator squads would clear each laboratory in turn, deploying by Thunderhawk to each one and then moving on, and as each lab was cleared, it would be garrisoned by a follow-up convoy of Cadians travelling overground by Chimera, and the Majos' team could then work through the data core of each one, recovering all the data. Estimated time for the convoy to travel and retrieve data from each lab was 8 hours, and so within 24 hours, the mission should be complete. And as the task force prepared, they received a return message from Lord Varius. A battle cruiser had been dispatched, ready to enact exterminatus on the moon as soon as Locke's forces were clear. By this point, D-99 had already started their deployment to the generator sites. At Site 4, the G-modified Elysians rappelled down from hovering Valkyries, fanning out around the squat generator housings as supporting Sentinels dropped in via grav chute. As the Valkyries removed to holding positions, a heavily armed Vulture gunship deployed Lieutenant Jurev's command squad, accompanied by a specially tasked tech servitor. But as the command squad stepped off the ramp, the second wave of attacks began. The first Jurev knew about the attack was a sudden, penetrating scream that echoed off the trees and through the vines, and then slowly died in a strangled gurgle. At all four generator sites, the perimeter suddenly came alive with chittering gaunts and gene stealers, as if they'd been lying in wait. The Elysians held, licks of Prometheum spilling from flamers as their front ranks were felled by flesh borer rounds or chopped to pieces by tyrannic claws. Confusion soon reigned. True seeing shadows in the undergrowth before each attack, until their vultures could get airborne again and the nearest foliage was shredded by Punisher rounds. D-99 had seen this all before, but there was no falling back. At Generator 4, Jurev's command squad deployed LAS cutters to break into the generator housing. Stab beams from flashlights played out across the sparking interior as the squad deployed, though the first men were cut down immediately by a lictor lurking in the darkness. Jurev threw himself to the side as his special weapons trooper took aim and dispatched the monster with a melter gun shot, and as the platoon outside fought off the Tyranids, the servitors set to work. By 2.01, Locke's ongoing reports transmitted that, despite heavy losses, Detachment D-99 had succeeded in raising the containment fences, and the mission had proceeded as planned. Commander Cullen and his Terminators had seen heavy resistance, but had cleared Lab Delta, and the Cadian 4th Company had departed alongside the Majos Biologist to garrison and retrieve the data, burning their way through the jungle with heavy flamers. But before he left for the lab, Arthon had been able to piece together 
together the timeline of the original breakout. Initial experiments had proceeded to plan, but the Tyranid specimens expanded at a far faster rate than expected. Shortly after the start of the experiment, whole new bioforms were being seen that were never originally captured. And it wasn't just the familiar ambulatory type. Tyranid bioforms had infested the local fauna, jagged new plants growing frighteningly fast. Of the three containment areas, Zone Alpha was the most problematic. Faced with containment fences, the Tyranids had responded by evolving wings, and soon regular purges of Zone Alpha were being conducted to flame the Xenos back into submission. Zone Beta had been relatively quiet. The researchers suspecting the bioforms deposited there had gone into hibernation. It was in Zone Omega, near Lab Gamma, that the collapse started. The containment fence failed, with no warning, and soon Lab Gamma was overrun by a range of Tyranid bioforms as the rest of the network went down one fence at a time. But despite the new detail, what was returned to Locke was little more than an out-of-office auto-reply. Lord Varius would of course deal with the matter urgently upon his return. By 202, Cullen and his Terminators had moved on to the complex at Lab Theta, while the Cadian Fourth and Majos Arthos had set to work at Delta. At Theta, Cullen initially suspected the complex to be deserted, the three Terminator squads advancing through the echoing corridors and into the abandoned lab rooms, swimming with the liquid from broken specimen jars. That was until gene stealers erupted from the floors, pushing grating panels aside to engage the Terminators up close. Sergeant Darak had to be flamed by his own heavy flamer carrier to burn the Xenos off of him, but the Terminators eventually managed to succeed in clearing the complex. Meanwhile, Fourth Company had deployed around Delta, safe behind containment fences, when from somewhere in the darkness they heard a shriek and pouring over the fence, came swarms of gargoyles, shrikes, and finally, a flying hive tyrant. Flares were launched, the Cadian Sabre defense platform searchlights lit up the sky, and the troopers opened fire as they fell back to the lab, but the swarm had come over every fence at once, and were behind them too. The last thing the commanding Captain Ryzek saw was a Xenos beetle burrowing into his chest as the fourth company were overrun. It was over so quickly, Majos biologist Arthos, salvaging data from the lab cogitators, barely realised the fourth were falling back before he was chopped clean in half by a shrike. Inquisitor Locke and Colonel Shakir tried to raise the fourth company and biologist Arthon to find out what was happening, but the Voxnet was a jumble of garbled cries for help. Locke sent another urgent report. The fourth were gone. The evolution of the Tyranids meant their only defences were useless. By this point, all three labs had been cleared, the Cadians deployed, and Locke recalled the Red Scorpions to the command centre in case of attack. They would try and collect more information as long as they could until evacuation became the only option. Again, no response was received. At 2.03, the command complex itself finally came under attack. With the ammonia levels in the air rising and the defenders watching the skies, the men of Detachment D-99 stationed there were caught off guard when the first attack came from below. In the middle of the defence lines, the ground collapsed and swarms of raveners emerged, aiming for the control centre itself. The Elysians fell back to planned defensive positions, holding off the raveners with las fire and sentry guns, but the attack was a feint. Inside the control room itself, the floor buckled and then exploded as a trigon forced its way into the complex, tearing about with abandon, smashing the ore specs and control systems, and with a wave of pressure, the containment fences once again came down. But as D-99 prepared to fight back the next wave, explosions blossomed on the other side of the command zone as two Harridans descended on the undermanned landing fields. Bioplasma rained down on D-99's Valkyries and Vulture gunships, and though the autocannon emplacements eventually found their range, bringing down one of the massive creatures on top of more Imperial flyers, the landing fields were in ruin. There would be nowhere near enough aircraft left for D-99 to effect a quick extraction. Inquisitor Locke ordered a full regroup, everyone back to the command complex to rescue whatever they could, 
but things continued to go badly. Back at Lab Theta, Culn had finished his search and destroy mission, but with the biologists gone, much of their work was now for nothing. They boarded their Thunderhawk for the recall, but as they ascended above the cloud cover, they were mobbed by thousands of spore mines floating in the atmosphere. Its engines clogged with I-Core and biomatter, the Thunderhawk carrying the elite of the Red Scorpions, went down somewhere in the depths of containment area Omega. Inquisitor Locke watched from the base as the transponder signal failed, but there was nothing he could do. In his estimation, there was no time left to mount a rescue mission, but that was not an opinion shared by the Red Scorpions defending the control center. Led by Apothecary Ryle, the remaining Space Marines pulled back from the defense lines and mounted up, a convoy of Razorbacks and Rhinos forcing their way into the jungle, their engines drowning out the protests of the Inquisitor. Locke let the Space Marines go, but not without a final warning, you and your chapter have not heard the last of this insubordination. Somewhere in containment area Amiga, the surviving Red Scorpions fought their way clear of the wreckage of the downed Thunderhawk. Chain fists cut the Dreadnought, Brother Halar, from his compartment. Around them were decaying trees mixed with the first small spore chimneys as the Tyranids started their breakdown of plant life. There were 15 Space Marines and one Dreadnought left to organise a defence with no communications and with the shadows of bioorganisms flitting through the darkness. Shortly, the first probing attacks came and then larger waves, Tyranids and the like being swept clear by the heavy flamers of the Terminator squad, but soon a pitched battle had emerged. Brother Halar waded into the waves of Gaunts, crushing them under his feet, but found himself in mortal combat with a huge Carnifex, which ripped his Inferno cannon from its mount in an explosion of Prometheum. Commander Cullen, fighting off waves of smaller bioforms, tried to reach the rest of his command, but the comms were silent as, across the wreckage of the Thunderhawk, Brother Halar and his foe sunk into the swamp, both dead. Around this time, Locke submitted another report. As far as he was concerned, Cullen was lost, the Red Scorpions had abandoned him, the Cadians out of communication, and D-99 without their flyers. And, attempting extraction, he'd been informed that the Cephestus had received new orders and was now on its way out of the system. This time, he received a reply. It is with deep regret I must inform you that the reinforcements I had ordered to your aid have had to be recalled as a matter of utmost urgency. For whatever reason, Lord Varius had abandoned him here. There was to be no rescue. The only ship in system belonged to the Red Scorpions. By 206, surveyor readings near the command center were off the scale. Locke knew what was coming. He heard the first shots from outside as the attack began. Wave after wave of gaunts assaulted the position. Locke and his command squad joined D-99 and the remainder of the Cadians at the perimeter as the waves kept coming. Elysians were dissolved around him by gobbets of bioacid. A counterattack by the Cadian's Hellhounds was cut short when a barbed hero jewel smashed its way through the tanks and then turned on Locke and his retinue. But as the Inquisitor was about to make his peace with the Emperor, a las cannon beam downed the giant bioform as the Red Scorpion's Razorbacks thundered in from the jungle. Heavy belt around spraying around, the attack was pushed back, but more would come. Locke ordered the Astartes to prepare for the next wave, but the Cephestus wasn't the only one that had received new orders. Cullen rounded on the Inquisitor. My orders are to evacuate the moon's surface. The situation here means my priorities have changed. My men are no longer at your command. We are not expendable assets. Locke raged. Officially, he was in command of the mission, and the Red Scorpions were now his only way off world, but Cullen wouldn't be swayed. Your mission is irrelevant, Cullen declared, and turned and walked up the ramp. Powerless to intervene, Locke watched as the nose ramp slammed closed and the gunship's engine pitch rose. The Thunderhawk lifted off, the engines boomed, and it rocketed skywards into the void. It was soon out of sight. Inquisitor Solomon Locke submitted one final report at 207-850-M41. With the battle raging and the silhouettes of bio-titans approaching through the ammonia fog, he signed off with one final line. 
death to the Xenos. And with that, the mission to Beta Amphelium 4 was over, but it wasn't quite the end of the story. Inquisitorial agents intercepted this message from Varius to unknown associates after the termination of the mission. The completion of my latest operation on Beta Amphelium 4 signals the end of this experimental phase of the Amphelian project. Varius had engineered the situation from the start. The Amphelian project, though it had yielded early results, had failed at all stations. He'd ordered the sabotage of the fences and deployed D-99, the Red Scorpions, and locked the planet as a test for the next step of his war against the Xenos. The events at Beta Amphelium 4 had proven to him that the gene program started with D99 should be expanded across the sector, shown the particular resilience of the Red Scorpions chapter. He was petitioning for a founding of three chapters to be created from their gene seed, and also rid him of a potential rival in the form of the Puritan Solomon Locke. With these goals achieved, Exterminatus was finally ordered. This made intriguing reading for the agents of the Inquisitorial representative to the High Lords. Obviously, Inquisitor Lord Varius was a heretic of some sort, and instructions were given to place him under investigation, to prepare his death warrant, and to inform the Calidus Temple of a potential mission, but the inaction of these orders was to be held for the moment. Lord Varius's unsound methods represent a threat to the stability of the Emperor's rule, and can only be tolerated while he continues to produce excellent results against the Tyranid Hive Fleets. Varius's days were numbered as soon as he stopped being so useful. And that is the end of the Amphelium project. Less a mission and more of a conspiracy within the Inquisition itself. I quite like this sort of story. We get the full mission in all of its Space Hulk meets Jurassic Park detail, and we get to see how fractured and backstabbing life in the Inquisition really is. The lab on Beta Amphelium 4 was a big endeavour, and there were others scattered across the sector, and genetic engineering programmes run on indentured guard regiments, and all this was unknown to the wider Inquisition, just the personal project of one Lord Inquisitor. What was the end result? We don't know. There is the occasional mention of Beta Amphelion in later supplements, mentioned as an official failure, but we don't know if the project as a whole bore any fruit, or if there ever was that new founding, or how long Varius survived to enact any of his plans before getting Calidus to death. The whole affair, just one more drop in the ocean a footnote in the history of the Imperium. Thanks for watching. And if you'd like to hear more about the lore of 40k, there should be a video just popping up to the right. And if you'd like to support the channel, click all the usual buttons, or there's a link to Patreon in the thing below. If you join up, you can get early access to videos, participate in the Tale of Four Gamers, and occasionally vote on the next book for our book club. See ya!